talk more about the power of political ads and at times their ineffectiveness. We're joined by Ken Goldstein, the professor of politics from the University of San Francisco, who uh, heads the program in Washington, D.C. for USF. So, uh, Ken, we thank you very much for your time. And how would you, uh, does, does the LBJ Daisy ad stand the test of time in terms of effectiveness for a political ad? Sure, uh, you know, good morning and thanks for having me. Well, listen, you know, I, you know, as you say, it is absolutely remains the most famous political ad ever. And as you said, it only, it only, uh, it only aired once. Um, you know whether or not that was uh, that was effective. Um, hard to say because you know that was an election in which the fundamental factors were very much in in, in LBJ's uh, corner. Would have been uh, would have been difficult for LBJ to lose that race. You know the question is as we head into this election year in 2014 when the United States Senate hangs in the balance and you have these toss up races. Um, these campaigns are you know are desperately looking for that ad that can. You know, not move a race 10 or 15 percentage points, but it can can it move it one or two in a Michigan, one or two in an Iowa, one or two in an Arkansas. Um, but certainly, in terms of looking back over time, you know, even for young people who uh, who were not even uh, not even born then, and actually, you don't even have to be so young not even to be born then. I wasn't even born then. Um, uh, that is the that is the ad that still pops to memory as the uh, as, as the classic, and as you said, probably the classic negative ad. And it's considered to be the first negative ad ever, right? Well, listen, you know, the, the first negative ad ever was probably somewhere in Rome or Greece. Okay, um, in I mean, fairness, I this, all right. You know, I think there's this notion, but I think it's an important point to make that there's this notion that, you know, <laughs> negativity in politics only got introduced the last couple of years. Polarization in politics only got introduced the last couple of years. And listen, one, I'm not so sure that negativity's bad and, you know, What's the major reason why Abraham Lincoln didn't have a negative television advertisement? It's because television didn't exist. Um, you know, and I know, you know, I know, JD, you were a big, uh, you were a big debater. You know, the Lincoln Douglas debates. Go back and read the Lincoln Douglas debates. They're just hour-long negative ads of people speaking. Yeah, but um, my, you know, my going favorite going on a little bit, but uh, you know, I think uh, you know, compare and contrast is important in politics. When you talk about that and uh, negative lines, Lincoln, in response to Douglas, uh, said to the crowd, my opponent is confusing a chestnut horse with a horse chestnut. Mm. Kind of a colorful way to, um, <clears throat> to uh, cast doubt on, uh, on his opponent. So we have that going on. Let, let's could update. Just picture the B-roll on that in today's ad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the B-roll would be, we'd have some splaining to do. Now, let's go to the here and now, Ken. Chris Christie's not on the ballot. New Jersey held its gubernatorial race, what, a year ago? Yet the Democrats are rolling out a Chris Christie Bridgegate ad. Is this designed basically to neutralize whatever national ambitions Governor Christie might have? It sounds to me like piling on a little bit. Um, it, I guess that's the reason. That could be the only reason, but with everything that went on with Bridgegate, but even more importantly for Chris Christie, what's gone on in New Jersey in terms of uh, the economic situation in New Jersey and what's gone on in Atlantic City, um, you know, I'm not sure he is at the top of the uh, of, of the Republican potential folks on the ticket now, and I'm not sure why dollars are being focused on him. Regardless of whether or not, you know, when they came into fruition, do you believe negative campaign ads work? I mean, because why would people be using them? Uh, listen, you know, well, uh, to, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, right, it depends what you mean by work. Um, the negative ads always work. Um, no. Can negative ads matter at the margin if they play into um, uh, a narrative that the campaign is pushing and that is backed up by other things? What's Absolutely. The, what's the formula then to make them work for that particular candidate? Listen, it has to be, you know, it has to be true. I don't think, you know, again, you know, you guys have been involved in politics. I don't think there's any magic formula where you do X, Y, and Z in an ad and it automatically works. But it's a function of doing the research on the front end, testing what's going to work, and delivering it in a compelling form. Um, you know, but again, listen, we can certainly think of outrageous and, you know, and unfair ads, but um, can you give us some I'm sorry, can you give us some examples of some effective ads that you've been seeing recently? 
you know, ironically, I think if you look back on 2012, um, you know, I have no normative problem, as is probably pretty clear, with negative advertising. Um, but clearly, the Obama campaign was very effective in defining Mitt Romney with their negative messages. And I think one of the huge mistakes of the Romney campaign was never introducing Mitt Romney to the American people. So I think sometimes we do, again, I have no problem with negative ads and they have their place, but sometimes I think there's this piling on. And if people already know a lot about an incumbent, already know a lot about something, continuing to pound that person, to use the technical poli-sci term, isn't gonna do much good. And I think what we're gonna see in some of these races, uh, um, in, in these swing Senate seats, I think you're gonna see a surprising amount of positive advertising by some of these Republicans because People in these states are angry at President Obama, angry at Democrats. They're ready to vote against Democrats, but they need to be convinced that Republicans are over that basic threshold. So uh, I think you may actually see some more positive advertising coming from the candidates. Now, I don't think you're going to see a lot of positive advertising coming from the groups. Ken, as you were talking about it, uh, the whole notion of defining your opponent, but a big backlash uh, that could melt the snows up in Alaska. The incumbent Senator Mark Begich had to take down a controversial ad as he was going after Republican Dan Sullivan. That ad featured a discussion of the murder of two seniors, crimes allegedly committed by someone who got a shorter sentence than he should have when Sullivan was the state's attorney general. The ad was pulled after a lawyer for the family's victims became involved. Dan Sullivan made it clear the statute was put into effect before he be became attorney general. Will this end up hurting Mark Begich? Well, I, you know, I, I, there's not tons of polling up in Alaska, but the evidence that we have now is that it is hurting, that it is hurting uh, Mark Begich. Um, and that's one of those things where, you know, Someone doing opposition research finds it, you craft the ad, and then no one checked with the family. And that ad probably stays up if the family doesn't, doesn't demand that it get taken down. And it just shows you when you're putting what you know, what one thinks might be a one might be a what might be a kill shot in an ad, you better have everything backed up. And when it's something as sensitive as that, you better make sure the family knows and approves of it. To be sure, there is backlash. We will have to end it there. Ken Goldstein, professor at the University of San Francisco from the Washington Center, we thank you very much. And now, Thanks. speaking of history, here's today's American Moment. It's a region of the world that has known little peace since the beginnings of recorded history. But in September of 1978, President Sadat of Egypt, Prime Minister Begin of Israel, and President Carter of the United States set out to change that. Initiated by the Egyptian leader's proclamation that he would be willing to travel anywhere, even Jerusalem, to seek peace, President Carter persuaded the two former enemies to meet with him at Camp David to seek a lasting peace. On the 17th of September, 1978, the Camp David Accords were signed, returning the Sinai to Egypt and creating a framework by which Palestinians could have autonomous and self-governing control over the West Bank and Gaza. During the announcement, President Carter was clear more work needed to be done. The questions that have brought warfare and bitterness to the Middle East for the last 30 years will not be settled overnight. In 1978, President Anwar Sadat and Prime Minister Menachem Begin were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Jimmy Carter's Nobel Prize would come later in 2002 for his decades of work seeking solutions to international conflicts. You're watching An American Moment on Newsmax TV.